All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. I know we got a lot of people piling in the room here, and I want to welcome all of you, and thank you for being on time. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is the next edition of the Beyond Compliance webinar and podcast series. I am Brian Sharp with Safety Chain Software, and uh, really appreciate so many of you carving out time in your very busy schedules, particularly on a Monday. Uh, it's unusual for us to do these on a Monday, but we have a, uh, a an opportunity to bring in uh, one of our, our favorite and most uh, requested guests, uh, Dr. Atchison over at the Atchison Group, and I'll be introducing him here shortly. But uh, this month's session is going to be around supply chain risks, a very popular topic, and in particular talking about closing the gaps to better protect your company. So uh, we got a lot of good stuff. I had a chance to take a sneak peek at some of the uh, content coming your way, and uh, we've got an action-packed session here. So without further ado, I'm going to dive into a couple of the things before we get started here. Uh, first is, if you're new to the series, uh, that's okay. It's a new series. We actually started this at the beginning of the year. Um, you might be familiar, and actually very appropriately, uh, with our guest today, Dr. Atchison. His, his team over at the Atchison Group, affectionately known as TAG, uh, have worked with us to put on the longest standing industry update known as FISMA Friday. It's going on for over five years now. It's been wildly popular. Uh, but one of the bits of feedback we got is, hey, the industry updates are great, but we really want to learn. So this series is designed to pick up where FISMA Friday leaves off and gives us an opportunity to bring in some of the leading thought, lead, you know, the thought leaders and practitioners and consultants that, that are out in the trenches and really bring them in here to talk some very tangible bite-sized content that you can take away and really apply in your business. So whether it's best practices or trends or tools, different ideas. Uh, we're, we're really making this kind of a, a place to share that and hopefully, again, an opportunity for you to take it back and apply it. Uh, so we uh, do these each and every month. They are for you, so we want to encourage you to engage with us. Let us know what you want to hear about, maybe a favorite topic or speaker, and uh, we'll do our best to get them booked, and uh, we uh, will continue uh, creating these if you keep on coming. So please let us know what will work. Uh, as you can imagine, these take a fair amount of time, effort, energy, and resources to put on, but uh, we do these free for our community. Uh, if, well, if, if anybody charges you to come, then you should go get your money back, but uh, I promise it will be worth, the, worth what you paid. It's a lot of really great content, and uh, again, our hope is that um, you take away some things that you can learn. We also hope that as you look for opportunities to apply what you're learning, from the technology side, uh, that's where we really can come in and help at Safety Chain. We're a cloud-based food quality management system, so we really focus on the food industry, obviously, and helping food companies improve productivity, profitability, and maintain compliance. And we do that with an end-to-end -end cloud-based platform that runs all of your core programs, food safety, quality, supplier compliance, and, and a whole lot more. So we've got some really exciting stuff. Uh, both the safety chain and a pretty exciting announcement coming along with our, our guests here today. So uh, stay tuned for both of those. You can learn more uh, over at safetychain.com. few tips as we get started. Uh, one is the format here is designed to be, you know, informational but professional, right? It, it's, uh, we want to, we kind of have a, uh, if we were sitting around at a, at a trade show, you know, having kind of an informal, casual conversation, that's what these are designed to be. So uh, we hope you take them that way, and uh, we really just focus on the content. Um, but we want to encourage you to ask questions, right? So uh, you'll be sending those along by using the Q&A box in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Myself and Jen will be behind the scenes fielding those, and we'll save those towards the end for a small period of time allocated to Q&A. And uh, what we, we can't get to, we'll try and take offline, but so we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, you'll notice that only the panel service displayed. So while we had hundreds of people registered for the webinar, you won't be kind of pushing that question out to everybody. We'll just see that and be able to respond uh, accordingly. So, uh, so don't be shy. And uh, usually I'll take care of this question up front. Usually the number one question we get is, will the link be shared? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Etchison has been kind enough to allow us to share the slides as well. So um, you can sit back and drink your coffee or you can take notes, whichever you prefer. Uh, but we'll make sure uh, probably sometime later this week get you a copy of, of the deck along with the replay that you can watch at your leisure or share with some of your, your colleagues who weren't able to join us today. 
And last but not least, uh, we are on a webinar platform, so uh, I'm sure many of you have used uh, WebEx and other tools, and you know sometimes it can be a bit clunky. If you're having any audio issues, uh, usually the, the best go-to move is just to swap, so you can use either your computer audio or call-in audio, and uh, we're, uh, we'll do our best to handle any technical questions that come in. Uh, if not, the old famous log out, log in move usually works pretty well. Uh, so bear with us if, if you do experience any of those. Uh, we'll do our best to help you and um, go from there. So uh, with that, we're going to get this party started here and get into our training topic around supply chain risk. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Etchison is uh, uh, widely known in the industry. You got it, you're quite the following. So first of all, make sure you can hear me okay. Uh, Dr. Etchison, are you, are you on the line here with us? I am, yes. Thanks, Brian. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and, and I'm sure everybody on the call has seen you, heard you speak, read your, your content, uh, probably worked with your company in some capacity at some point. Uh, but in case uh, we need a quick review, quick reminder, I'm going to give a real a brief bio here. Uh, Dr. David Atchison is President and CEO of the Atchison Group, also known as TAG, uh, brings decades of experience across the entire food and import safety sector, helping clients enter new markets, enhance the value of their products, and navigate dynamic scientific and regulatory systems. Uh, David's background in medicine, food safety, and molecular pathogenesis, and the regulatory environment of both FSIS and FDA provides a unique depth of experience shared with all of their clients, and they do some amazing work over there. We are very um, proud to be able to partner with them and very excited to have you here today. And I could go on and on, but I'm going to turn it over to you, my friend. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here. We're really excited to have you. Well, thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's dialed in, as Brian said earlier, especially on a Monday. Um, I don't know, we're all very busy putting out fires. <clears throat> so um, on that note, let me get going here. Um, as you know, today's topic is around supply chain. Um, and what I want to do over the course of this webinar is, is really provide you some, some thinking around, around why supply chain is a big risk, what's going on with it, what are some of the regulatory perspectives on supply chain, and why has the uh, Food and Drug Administration focused on it from a FISMA perspective. Um, and then sort of round that out um, in the la latter part of the conversation this morning to talk about approaches that you can take to, su to control supply chain risk. So as, as we get into that theme, it's like, why is it important? What's changed? Um, and then thinking a little bit about some of the strategies that one can use to, to help manage that risk. Um, because that really is where the rubber hits the road. We all want to manage that risk. but how do you do it in a cost-effective way? So as we begin to think about supply chain, um, obviously that's always been a part of the food business. Oh, it doesn't matter where you are in, the, in, in that continuum from the farm through to retail and restaurants, um, you, you have suppliers. Um, at the farm level, you have suppliers, and at the restaurant level, you have suppliers, and everybody in between has suppliers. So it, it is all an interconnected system. And again, wherever you are in that system, we've got an increasing complex, complexity to our food supply. Um, we need to be innovative. We need to have new products. We need to have new flavors. Um, there is an expectation that we have exciting ingredients. There's issues around new threats to food, new microbes that we start to worry about, like salmonella and peanut butter, although that's not new, that's 10 years old now. Um, different strains of E. coli that emerge in different places, like in flour and stuff that we yeah, kind of knew that they may be there, but didn't really worry about it until we have an outbreak and we have regulators uh, starting to take different approaches to controlling risks. Um, companies are doing more testing. Um, whether you are, uh, if you're a supplier yourself and you're sending an ingredient, you, know, you may find that you get a call from one of your customers saying, hey, David, we, uh, we tested that stuff you sent us, that ingredient that you sent us, um, and we found listeria in it. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. I know I, know I have been involved in those types of situations. And, and you, you want to say, well, why the heck did you test it? And but you realize you can't, and you have to react to it because um, the very fact that they've tested it, and if it's an FDA-regulated product, or even if it's not, 
um, there's a high probability that you will be in a reportable food registry state and you'll have you'll have regulators coming to pay a visit. Um, Laid on on top of all of that is is all of this innovation and new threats, et cetera, et cetera, and, and outbreaks really focused um, the Food and Drug Administration and Congress when they put the Food Safety Modernization Act together to realize that supply chain was a big risk. And we'll get into that in just a second when we talk about the FISMA side of this. But recognizing that supply chain is a big risk and the feeling was that we need to regulate the supply chain um, risk side of things. And, and for that reason, the Food Safety Modernization Act put in new requirements about supply chain risk control. So as we move forward into this, we've talked about complexity. We've talked about how um, the system is, is, we talk about a supply chain, but it's much more of a supply web. And um, the slide that I've just popped up on the screen now is, is just a simple graphic of, of representing the kind of complexity that we deal with. Pretty much whoever you are in the supply chain, as I mentioned earlier, whether you're at the farm end or you're at the retail end, um, you are receiving something from somebody and you are selling it to someone. Um, if you're right at the very end, you may have just one customer. Um, or you may be selling it to a restaurant who is then selling it to another customer. And this graphic just speaks to the challenges. If we say, uh, looking at this graphic, that, that that blue box is you, wherever you are on that supply chain, you have likely a very good idea who your tier one suppliers are. You've got relationships with them, you've got contracts with them, you obviously have an, um, a business relationship with them, they are sending you, selling you something, you're paying for it. Um, but as we work back into tier two, high probability, if you're like anybody else, that you don't have a lot of visibility into that. Um, you will have some, and you may put the burden on your tier one suppliers and say, hey, we expect you to control that risk upstream. Um, but as you track back, it gets, visibility gets less, challenges get greater, um, barcodes get lost, products get repacked, um, all sorts of things happen that create complexity. And I think one of the key points uh, that, that I want to get over today is that as you look up at your supply chain and you're looking upstream, is to ask yourself, what are the risks that I really need to worry about? And some, sometimes the risks are large and sometimes they're small. Sometimes they may impact a lot of your products, sometimes only a very little. And we'll get into that in a, in, in a little while to talk about how to manage that. But as you look upstream, asking yourself, where is the risk and who's controlling it? So as we continue down this theme of, of managing supply chain risk, how do you manage it? And everybody approaches this in, in, in different ways, but there's a lot of similarities. Audits are very frequent. A lot of companies rely on audits. They may be second party. Some manufacturers and retailers will go out into the marketplace and look at their suppliers, go visit. Uh, understand the risk, understand the level to which it's being controlled. That's a luxury that most don't have, uh, most have, don't have access to do. That's very resource intense. Most food companies aren't big enough to do that. So they rely on third party audits. Um, you may be relying on your specifications. You may simply be saying, well, here's what we expect. And, and of course, the, the supplier is going to say, yep, yeah, we, we, we meet the specs. Um, you may be relying on a certificate of analysis. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, you may have your own testing program to some extent, but we all know that testing isn't a solution. Um, it gives you some sense of control, but you certainly can never test your way to safety in the food system. We all know that. You may be monitoring your supplier behaviors in terms of um, are they sending you material that is just in spec? Um, are they missing deadlines? Are they not responsive? All of those sorts of things which give you a, give you a sense that your supplier is perhaps not quite as, uh, as, as on the game as you would like them to be. 
So everybody manages the supply chain risk in slightly different ways. And one of the one of the key themes I want to try to talk about today is looking at managing supply chain on a risk-based approach. Where is the risk in our supply chain? And should I put more resources into those high-risk areas than in the lower-risk areas? And the obvious answer to that is yes. Um, everything that we do today needs to be risk-based because the risks are, are large. Some risks are bigger than others. The impact of some of those risks are greater than others. So approaching this in a risk-based way, in my view, makes a lot of sense. How do you do that? We'll get to that in just a bit. So some of the key questions along that lines is, do you really have an understanding of the risks? Do you know who's really controlling those risks? As I said earlier, looking at that little graphic, you're standing there in the blue box and you're looking upstream, and you may think, well, I know, I know the company we're buying it from isn't controlling the risk, and I don't have really good insight into who they're buying it from. That's an important question. Um, are you able to track all the information that you receive? So we may be getting third-party audits and certificates of analysis and lots of information coming in about our suppliers, but do you have the resources, do you have the capability to review that information and to be able to, um, to, be able to truly understand it and manage that risk accordingly? Unfortunately, in today's environment, we often get buried in information and we don't really have a chance to look at it. So are you asking for the right things and are you able to review those critical components of, of information? Final thought on the question is, is actually who's in charge of the supply chain? That gets very complicated um, in many companies because it's usually a combination of people. It may be going right back to the R&D department, product development. They come up with this, um, this, this great new product that is, um, they, they're, they're loving it because they've discovered these really cute little red berries that they can put on the product and it makes it look very attractive. Marketing's all over it, sales all over it. Um, and they're telling you, we've identified a supplier of these little red berries and it's from some part of the Amazon jungle. <laughs> and you're sort of saying, well, wait a minute, you know, it's like, um, What's, what's their risk control and are they, how are they controlling the risks of picking these berries and, and harvesting them and shipping them and packing them? It's, you know, it's, it's a trivial example, but we all know how that happens. So we have product development. We have the research and development folks. We have procurement who are looking out to get the best price for the little red berries. We've got um, maybe somebody on the operational and manufacturing side who's involved. We've got finance involved. We've got legal involved because of contractual relationships. And finally, somebody says, oh, maybe we should involve the food safety guys here just to make sure these little red berries are safe. And when you finally get involved and you look at the little red berries and you look at them and say, well, these may be cute little red berries, but they're actually deadly nightshade and we probably shouldn't use them. Um, meanwhile, there's a whole system in place. It's, again, a silly example. And of course, that would never happen. But my point, I hope, is, is clear that the complexity of supply chain isn't just what's going on upstream. It's all the parts and pieces in your company that are involved in managing it. So as we continue down this theme of questions and, and how do we approach some of these um, points, let's move on to talk about the regulatory side of supply chain. As I mentioned a little earlier, the the Food and Drug Administration recognized that supply chain control was critical in terms of managing food safety risk. So there's two key rules to talk about um, in relation to supply chain control, and they are very, very similar. One of them is in relation to the preventive controls rule for human and animal foods, and the other is the foreign supplier verification program. Both of these obviously have multiple other facets to them in terms of controlling risk, but they do both have a very similar theme about supply chain risk control. And really what it boils down to is if you are subject to the preventive control rule or if you are an importer or subject to foreign supplier verification program, then the expectation from the FDA 
is that you will have assessed the risk in your supply chain and you will have verified that that risk is being controlled. It's, it's actually conceptually very simple. Where's the risk and is it being controlled? There's obviously details about how do you check that it's being controlled, but if you are under the preventive control rule, then you have to do that. Um, and if the supplier is responsible for controlling the risk that you've identified, then you've got to make sure that they are indeed controlling that risk, and you can do that in a number of ways. If you're an importer, same principle. The importer is required to determine are the risks in the product, the ingredients, the food products that I'm importing, and if the answer is yes, and the foreign facility is controlling that risk, then you have to verify that that risk is being controlled. It's, it's conceptually exactly the same approach for both. So, some areas of confusion on this is that if you have to comply with the preventive control rule, uh, as I've just said, you need to assess the risks in your supply chain and make sure they're being controlled, irrespective of where in the world you're, you, you're acquiring that product. It may be domestic source, it may be international source, it doesn't matter. You have to go through that assessment, risk assessment, and verify that the risk is being controlled, whether you're importing the food or not. If you are an importer and you are not a manufacturer, so you don't need to be compliant with the preventive control rule because it doesn't apply to you, you're an importer, you're not registered as a manufacturer processor, packer or holder, then you need to be compliant with the foreign supplier verification program. Where some of the confusion comes in is, is that I'm a manufacturer, I'm, I know I'm importing foods, I'm, I'm a registered firm, I need to be compliant with the PC rule, the preventive control rule, and do I also need to be compliant with foreign supplier verification program? And the answer there is, is no, you don't. You can cover it all under your supply chain risk control. Um, as part of your preventive control rule requirement. So um, that got very confusing as these rules were being created, and I, and I think there is still some confusion in the industry about that. As I've already said, the approach to supply chain control applies to both the preventive controls and foreign supplier verification program. The principles of the two are the same, and it feeds right into what we've been, what we've been talking about up to this point. Is there a risk? What are the hazards? So the process that we go down here is, number one, let's do a hazard analysis on the materials that we are sourcing. Whether it's an ingredient, it's a finished product, um, or it's, it may be primary packaging. The process here needs to look at the hazards in those three areas, ingredient, product, packaging. Evaluate the risks. What is the risk? Is it a microbiological risk, a chemical risk, a physical risk? Going down the way that we have done it for years with regard to hazard analysis. When we have identified the risk, salmonella, allergens, pesticides, whatever that risk is, the next question to ask is who's controlling the risk? And there are three options really on that one. Who's controlling the risk? Number one, I am controlling the risk. I've done the assessment. I'm sourcing an ingredient that I've determined has a risk of salmonella. I'm using that ingredient in a product that I'm going to cook, and I'm going to control that risk as part of my food safety plan. That's box checked. You've assessed the risk. You've determined who's controlling the risk, and you're controlling the risk. Similar scenario, you're relying on the supplier to control the risk. You're receiving an ingredient, say it's a spice, you've got a risk of salmonella in it, and you're using that spice on your finished product once you've cooked it, just before you package it, you're, re you're relying entirely on the supplier to control the risk. So number one, you're controlling the risk. Number two, the supplier is controlling the risk. And then number three is that, is that you're not, the supplier's not, but your customer is controlling the risk. That's the third option, in which case you, you, as part of FISMA, and this is an evolving state, and if anybody's got questions on it, we can talk about it, 
But in theory, you need a letter of assurance from your customer that they are controlling the risk. But as I said, that's got complex, and the FDA is still trying to figure out just how to make that work. But those are our three options. You're controlling it, or the supplier is controlling it, or the, your customer is controlling it. <clears throat> so let's focus on that the supplier is controlling the risk. In that case, down to that uh, next bullet, we have to verify that the risk is indeed being controlled by the supplier. That involves the hazard analysis and the verification process, which um, can be undertaken in a number of ways to make sure that you're only using approved suppliers, ones that you have taken through this process. What's the hazard? How are they controlling it? I verified they controlled it. Make sure that you've got your approved supplier list. FDA can ask to see that and ask to have you show them how you have approved the suppliers. We all know supply chains get pickled up sometimes and there are corrective actions needed. So if a supplier has failed, failed to verify in some way, how have you corrected it? What have you done to, to uh, execute on a corrective action? Make sure it's documented. And of course, like everything to do with regulations these days, make sure you keep all solid records around everything that you've done so that uh, you are able to demonstrate to the regulators where you are. Driving this down to a practical level, um, hazard analysis, et cetera, is, is, is an approach that, that we've used and, and can work well. First of all, create a list of everything that you're using, all of those ingredients and products, everything, the basic ingredients, the products, the primary packaging. Do a hazard on every single one of them, hazard analysis. Determine if any are class one level. That's, that's important in terms of the verification process. And as I've said, step three, is determine who is going to control that risk you've identified. As if it's you, you build it into your food safety plan, and if it's your supplier, you have to verify they're controlling the risks. So it's, it's, it's a simple approach, but this is the sort of thing that FDA will want to see. List of ingredients, the hazard analysis, who's controlling the risk, and then the verification part. Make sure as you are creating your list of suppliers that you include all the locations if there's multiple manufacturers. So you may be buying from a big global entity who's sending you ingredients from five different sites. The risks in all of those sites could be different. The verification activities could be different. If you determine that an on-site audit is needed to the next bullet down there where it says for all class one risks you need an on-site audit, that's written into the rules. If you've determined there's a class one risk that the supplier is controlling, then the default is that you need an on-site audit. Obviously there, if you're sourcing from five sites, you need an on-site audit of each site. An on-site audit of the corporate entity won't necessarily meet the regulatory requirement. This has been a bit of a sticking point in terms of the on-site audit. Um, Obviously, a lot of companies are using um, third-party audits as part of their routine supply chain control, GFSI audits being the obvious example where we just have a GFSI audit and we document that it's been done. Um, in our view at the moment, <clears throat> that seems to satisfy the Food and Drug Administration. GFSI audits, the GFSI process is very, very well aligned with FISMA requirements. So a company that is certified at GFSI level has effectively had um, an appropriate audit, at least based on everything that we're seeing right now. I've, I've yet to see the FDA come out and say, no, the GFSI audit isn't adequate. You need to do more than that. And a number of the GFI, GFSI schemes have now got FISMA addendums, which you could check into to see if that's, that's part of the scheme that you're requiring for your suppliers. So the default is to have an on-site audit. Um, this can be avoided, but you need to um, document why. An example there, I'm going to go back to my example of the little red berries from the Amazon jungle. It may well be that you can't find a uh, suitable accredited auditor within a thousand miles of where the little red berries are being, are being made. So that's fine. The FDA accepts that. 
um, but you would then need to control the risk in some other documented way, such as a testing program, such as a very solid requirement about certificates of analysis. So even though the class one on-site audit is the default, there are ways that you can, you can avoid that so long as you have something that you can talk about and you can document that's equally robust. Um, other risks, less than a class one, you can use a certificate of analysis, you can review their food safety plan, the suppliers, you can have your testing, your own testing program. So there's a number of approaches that you can take here, but keep in mind, when you've done your hazard analysis, if you've said this is a class one risk, then the default is to have that on-site audit. A word on COAs. Um, very, very common in the industry. We all use them and, and we rely on them. But, but please, if you're using a certificate of analysis, do make sure you know what it means. And um, the default is, oh yeah, of course I know what it means. You know, it's like it says that the, the product is meeting the spec. Well, yeah, of course it does. Um, and, you know, jokingly we all say, well, rarely do you get a COA that's sent to you that says, you required it to be negative for salmonella, but we're sending you one that's positive anyway. It's a joke, it's funny, um, never happens. Of course it doesn't happen. Um, but is that COA really meaningful? And if in your risk analysis you've decided this is a really important ingredient, if it goes wrong, I'm in so much trouble. Um, I may be able to blame the supplier, but in the meantime, I've lost my brand, I may have hurt people, I may get sued, it's a really important ingredient for me. In that case, make sure that COA is a strong one. And what I mean by that is, do you know how that sampling is being done? Yeah, it's negative for salmonella, but is that truly a robust sampling strategy? Is it an N equals 60 sampling strategy? Is it adequate amounts of the product? Essentially, you, you, you may not know that. But, it, but how much reliance can you put on the, on, on the result? Is the testing method they're using an approved one? Is the lab that they're using a, an, an accredited one? Is it one that knows what it's doing? Um, do you need to do this for every COA? Not necessarily. But you should certainly pay attention to what's behind a COA on those ingredients that you've determined are the ones that are most important to you. So make those CO, COAs count. Um, we use them, let's just make sure we can rely on them. So, from a regulatory perspective, keep in mind that you need to maintain a list of your approved suppliers. And these are ones that you've done your hazard analysis, you've got the verification data uh, paperwork, you've made sure that, that if you're using uh, third-party audits that they are current, um, that you've looked at them. Make sure that you've got appropriate corrective actions in place and that you've documented and, and, and keep those records. If you do that for the preventive control rule and the foreign supplier verification program, you should be in good, good shape with regard to an FDA inspection. So let's move a little bit into the last theme of the conversation this morning and talk a little bit about what I've suggested along the line that not all of our suppliers are created equal in terms of risk. How do you determine risk? We know they're not all equal. How do you differentiate? Where do you put your resources? What are the factors that you should think about? Um, there, is, there is a relatively common practice that we come across, I would say, fairly often in TAG, that a, a company will say, well, we require a third-party audit and a certificate of analysis for everything. That may be okay, but you well know, if you stop and think for a second, that some of your suppliers are a much greater risk than others. What do I mean by that? And how do you get into that? How do you define that? Well, an approach that we've started to use at, at TAG, and we're working with uh, Safety Chain to build this out into, a, into an easily usable software program is, is, is something that, that runs along the lines of these three themes. You're talking about an ingredient that you're, that you're getting from uh, somebody. We're talking about the inherent risks of the ingredient itself. If you look at the hazard analysis, is it, is it a high-risk ingredient? Is there been a recurring history of problems with it? 
Is this something that you know you need to pay more attention to than, than other ingredients because of its track record, its history, its, its country of origin, all of, those, all of those points? The second dimension is the supplier behaviors. Is this something that you need to be thinking about with regard to the suppliers? Do they have good programs in place? Do they have their risks controlled? And the third element is how you use that ingredient. Is this used um, in, in all your products, in high-risk products, in high-profile products? So looking at ingredient risk, supplier risk, and how you use those ingredients is a, is, is a good approach to take. So let's dive into, the, into those just a little bit more detail. First one around the, the, the ingredient risk. This is something where the approach we take is to develop a series of questions, usually 10 or 12, 15 questions that, that you could ask of each ingredient. Does it have a history of a problem? Does it have microbiological risks associated? Does it have chemical risks? Is it from a high risk area? Those types of questions that you can ask about, about each one. And when, when you do that, you can rank the response. Each question could be ranked as, as a, it's a high risk answer, it's a medium risk answer, or it's a low risk answer. And the tools that we build, and we build, and we'd be very happy to share it with anybody on this, uh, on this webinar um, in the future if you'd be interested, takes this and actually drives it into numbers. It puts scores on, and it allows you to rank your ingredients um, from highest risk to lowest risk based on a series of questions and scores. By asking the same question for each, each ingredient, we can then rank those ingredients, looking at them from highest risk to lowest risk, not just based on instinct and experience, although that has a lot to do with it, but based on concrete, well-thought-out questions around ingredient-related risks. The same strategy applies to suppliers. Again, putting together a series of questions around the supplier risk. Clearly, we know that supplier behaviors has a huge, a huge part in controlling the risk. The inherent risk of, of say, a spice may be the same. If it's something like uh, white pepper, black pepper, it has a, it has a history of problems. Um, it, it's, there's been recurring outbreaks, um, recalls from salmonella in, in pepper over the years. We know from our hazard analysis that's a problem, that's a high risk uh, ingredient. So how do we, how do we manage that? Um, so our, our ingredient questions have said, yeah, this one's, this one's high risk. Obviously the way a supplier is behaving has a very important part of that in terms of, of how they're controlling that risk. If they're steam pasteurizing, is that, is that system validated? If they're, when it comes out of the pasteurizer before they're, pasteur before they're packing it and sending it to you, do they have a good environmental control program? Inherent risk is high on, on peppers, but the supplier behaviors go an enormous distance in terms of how that risk is actually being controlled and how it translates down to you. So again, same principle where we're asking a series of, sa of the same questions on supplier behaviors to allow you to put that together numerically on a, on a risk-based system. And then the third component is how you use the ingredient yourself. If this is an ingredient that is used in basically everything that you produce, and thus if there's a problem with that ingredient with the supplier, you, you are going to have to do a massive recall. It's going to be going to put you out of business for a month because everything that you've got in commerce, everything with uh, shelf life will have to be pulled back. That's very different. It may be an inherently low risk kind of ingredient and the supplier may be really good, but the impact to you is enormous. And that obviously needs to play into your, into your risk-based thinking. Another example would be what I call a flagship product. So it's, it's a product that is that consumers associate with your brand. And if it's recalled, then, then that's going to be very economically damaging to your brand because it is one of your key flagship products. It may not be the highest volume product, but it's a really important one. Again, just a different dimension to think about when it comes to supply chain risk control. 
And then finally, when it comes to uh, direct impact to you, is, is, the, is the economics. That kind of plays into the first two that I've talked about. Um, if this particular ingredient or product was uh, found to be a problem and you'd used it, is that going to have massive Im economic impact on you? So, so looking at this, at this risk-based approach is sort of coming at it from inherent risks of, of the ingredient, the supplier behaviors, and the way in which you use the product. By doing that, you can start to put together a, a risk-based strategy. And really what, what this is doing, it's building off the FISMA requirements. The FISMA requirements are saying, identify the risks and make sure they're being controlled. And it really is this kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. What are the risks and, who, and make sure the supplier is controlling them? What I'm suggesting here is to take it a bit further because you've got limited resources. You cannot do everything to every supplier. And you know, um, at least deep down, that you've got high-risk suppliers and you've got lower-risk suppliers. The point that we're trying to make here is that there are ways and there are tools that will allow you to actually rank these risks and take appropriate actions and use your risk management dollars that is truly based on a risk assessment. As we look at supply chain, final thoughts and final themes here is, is one of the things that we need to be thinking about is new products, new suppliers, and current products or current suppliers. Often when we're getting innovative, and I talked about that earlier, is we've got, we've got a, a, a group of people working as a team, product development, food safety, procurement, supply chain, um, maybe legal, contractual language. Everybody's sort of working together around new exciting products, new suppliers, the whole onboarding process. Um, while it can be somewhat out of control if R&D is entirely driving it and food safety is brought in right at the end and of course when we're always seen as, oh, you shut everything down, you just, you're just there to cause problems, um, we really need to be at the table right, right from the beginning. But bringing on new products will eventually, if we're using some sort of, um, of, of, of stepwise gate, gated process, will get us to the right point. We've understood our risks, we've got our exposures figured out, and then we manage it accordingly. Um, we love the little red berries. Um, they're really great. They come from an obscure part of the world, but they're, they're, they're going to be really exciting for our new product. That's okay. We just need more, more resources to be able to make sure that we've checked them out, that they're safe, and that there isn't a problem. Um, so this is all sort of part of the new product, new supplier. If you're using a risk-based tool like the one I just talked about, looking at ranking ingredients and suppliers and the impact on the company, you can put new products in that one too. You can do the same assessment, the same risk approach and say, well, as we look at all of the suppliers and the ingredients we're going to use, this new one you want to go for is, is out of our norm. This is really high risk. And food safety should say, we can control that risk. Hopefully you can. But in order to do that, we need to do more. We need to get on site. We need to do more testing. We need to do something. So it's truly being done in, in, in a totally transparent and open way. And that allows us to, to develop, in a safe way, new products, new suppliers. Remember, as you're doing this from a FISMA perspective, that as you add new suppliers, make sure that you put them on your approved supplier list. The challenge often becomes with our current suppliers. Often a company will onboard a new supplier and then sit back and relax and say, oh, we're all good. Um, a very key important part of managing supply chain risk is to watch what's going on with your suppliers. Develop a process to track and trend the data. Look at things like timeliness, meeting the specs, the COAs that I've talked about, making sure that they're good ones. Um, are, they, are they always on time? Are they on track? looking at the corrective actions um, around site visits or warnings, those, those types of things, um, really paying attention to your current suppliers. Often the emphasis is on the innovation and the new suppliers, and once a supplier is onboarded, it's all fine until it's not. Um, and that might, 
my point there is is often a company will put a lot of resources into onboarding a new supplier, um, but not tracking and trending current suppliers. You really want to know when a supplier is starting to drift off the curve, drift into an area where you feel the risks have changed. So um, it is important to develop tracking and trending systems to monitor what's going on with, with your current suppliers as much as it is to onboard uh, good suppliers for innovative products. So final thoughts here. Um, we've obviously exclusively focused for the last uh, 40 minutes on supply chain risk control. Looking at it, why is it a big problem? It's a big problem because of the need for innovation and exciting foods and consumer demands. It clearly is the area likely where you have least visibility. It's highly complex. Um, and it probably is your biggest risk because you don't have your finger on the pulse nearly as much as you'd like to. And that's just the reality of the business that we all work in. So being proactive, looking at how do you get out in front of this as opposed to reactive when you've had a problem is really important. That's the theme of FISMA, prevention. Where's the risk? How is it being controlled? And, and what I'm suggesting is that you, if you're under FISMA, you've absolutely got to do that. But look beyond that. Look at how you can put your resources where the risk is. And I've talked briefly about using a sort of risk-based approach, a scientific approach, ingredient risk, supplier risk, how you're using the product and put numeric scores on it. So that you're truly managing that risk based on data and based on, on essentially available resources matched with the risks that you've identified. Um, you can leverage past history. There's software that we've worked with before called Horizon Scan. Um, which, which is a software solution that allows you to look at past history, can be very helpful, um, and leveraging the sort of technology that I've talked about. And as I said, we'd be very happy to give you more details on, on this exciting new software tool that we've developed with Safety Chain, which is entirely focused on, on taking what I talked about and driving it down to practical, implementable technology to help you manage your supply chain risk. Um, so with that, I think, um, Brian, um, we're, we're open to some questions if, if yeah. we've got a couple um, in, the, in the few minutes that are left. So I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. No, that was fantastic. Thank you. And a uh, lot of really great content. Uh, we, do, we do have a couple questions. I'll, I'll pepper with you uh, over, over to you. But uh, I think you covered so many important topics there. And I think what's, what's exciting for us, too, is, is not only just having this focused approach, but the fact that uh, you guys are working on the technology side, because uh, that is where all this is going, um, which actually ties into a couple of the questions pretty well. So I'll start with the first one, uh, which I think is good, could apply to a lot of the audience. Uh, how much do you, how much you uh, think the FDA will put, I'm sorry, how much focus do you think the FDA will put on the supply chain control requirements? Um, you know, in, in the short term, they will, they will let that roll, in my view, and I'm just guessing here, they will let that roll a little bit because they realize that's complex and it's difficult. Um, I think as FISMA bites and, and we're going to start to see enforcement and as inspectors understand this, because it's been such an area of risk, Brian, I think that the FDA is going to come in here and in, into a plant and, and have you go through how you're controlling the supply chain risk. Um, yeah. Now that's often a challenge for companies because it's especially if it's if it's multiple manufacturing facilities, because supply chain risk is often controlled at the corporate level, um, mm -hmm. and that that creates challenges when the plant personnel aren't actually really controlling that risk. They're not doing the assessments all being hap ha happening at corporate, and I think FDA is still just trying to figure out how do we do that because when they go in the mm -hmm. plant, the plant's going to say. Well, it's all done at corporate. You need to go talk to them, which is an entirely yeah. appropriate response to that question. Mm. So, sure. my my view of that is 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 not yet, but only in in time it'll happen. Yeah, no, it's such a good point. We hear the same. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, this is a, a a really great question and something we actually see from the technology side um, that he was asking. So we have somebody who's. Uh, Ryan says, new to a company that oversees comments, uh, supplier approval process needs improvement for sure. 
We have over 100 different ingredients from roughly 20 to 30 suppliers. I, don't, I do not believe we have the resources for third-party audits, and he falls with the question said, so what's the best route to go? Is it just verification? I do not know if that is adequate. And that's a, a common one that I'm sure you see all the time out there. Yeah, you know, I think, well, let's, let's approach this from two lenses, Brian. I mean, the first is what's, what's the regulatory requirement? And, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm guessing, uh, at least I'm going to answer this question in the context that this is not actually an FDA-regulated facility, the person who's asking the question. So um, the regulatory requirement is that if, you, if you, you need to do that hazard assessment I talked about on your ingredients, if you have determined that there's a class one risk in any of those ingredients, and you know, class one risk being salmonella, listeria, E. coli, 0157 type things, allergens, those sorts of things, the sorts of agents that would trigger a class one recall, if you think there's a risk of that that you believe needs to be controlled, then you know, like it or not, the regulatory requirement is that you need to have an on-site audit. Um, yeah. Now, you know, what typically a company will do is push back on the supplier and say, you need to get an on-site audit. You need to pay for it if you want to ship to us. Now, I realize mm -hmm. that can get to be a business challenge and, you know, you can say, well, we're not going to sell to you. <laughs> but, um, right. you know, I, I, frankly, in today's environment, if somebody hasn't got an on-site audit they can share with you, then I sort of question yeah, you know, do you really want to be sourcing from them? What's going on? Um, but that's the that's the bar entry from a purely regulatory perspective. If you don't have that, um, then you're not you're not meeting compliance. If it's a class one risk, now I want to differentiate second party audit. Obviously, the person asking this question doesn't have the team to send all over the world to get on site. You don't need to do that. You can rely on a third party, have your supplier send you a third party audit. Um, take a good look at it, make sure you feel comfortable with it. Follow up with questions. That's, that's frankly the way that, that you need to do it. Um, that's, that's regulatory compliance. If, if you're looking at it from a bigger risk perspective, um, then, then go down the deep dive of looking at those, those hundred or so suppliers, a hundred or so ingredients from 20 or 30 suppliers. And focus on the areas where you've got the biggest threat. If, you're, if some of those ingredients are being used in all your products, pay attention to it. Um, risk base it. I mean, I get that. You can't, out of your 20 or 30, there may be five of them that are, from a business economic perspective, really critical. Focus on them. Put the sure. resources there. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're doing your best to match your resources with, with, with the risk, which in today's environment is all you can do. There's risk everywhere. You can't do everything. All you can do is to be logical and try to push the risk mm -hmm. down as far as you can. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, and that's a good question because we do hear that a lot. Um, got another question here uh, from Diana. It says, uh, if I'm a brand owner but all my products are made by co-packers, uh, do I have uh, do I have to have food safety plans for my products, or can I use the food safety plans for my co-packers instead? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, and let me answer that from two lenses. Um, the co-packer, and again, I'm assuming that this is a this is an FDA regulated facility because we're talking about food safety mm -hmm. plans. Those mm -hmm. co-packers would need to be registered entities in their own right, and as such, they need to have their own food safety plan. They need to have, um, they need to be compliant with, with, with the regulations. Um, the, the burden for regulatory compliance is on them, not on you, um, mm -hmm. very, very clearly. Now, of course, because they're co-packing and because they're packing your branded product, if they make a mistake or they get put out of business or they do something wrong, um, they, they may be getting the, um, the, the stick from the regulators but the brand impact is yours, it's not theirs. So sure. that's, that, that's a double-edged sword, where from a regulatory perspective, the burden is all on them. From a brand perspective, my advice would be, you make sure that those co-packers are following the rules and that their supply chain control program and that their manufacturing process is meeting your standards. That's a, that's a contractual requirement that you have with them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, I, I hear all too often of a company who just sort of says, ah, oh, yeah, we're co-packing a bunch of things. Um, and I'll say, well, well, how often do you go visit the co-packers? Oh, not very often. They, you know, they always seem to do a good job. And that sort of instantly makes me sure. like squirm okay. because, right. you know, they're making products with your name on it. And I mean, they say, well, yeah, they are. So, I mean, people get it, but um, no, I, I want, so, so just to clarify, answering that question is, Regulatory compliance, it's all on the co-packer. Brand protection, it's all on you. Um, and I think look at, look at your co-packers. If you've got two, if you've got 20, um, which of those are most important? And, and use your risk-based thinking to say, I want to get out to that one and that one and that one this year, and then next year I'll do a couple others. But look at it through a risk-based lens because um, brand-wise, it's, it's all on you. Yeah, oh, great advice. Uh, try and squeeze in a couple more here before we, we let you go. Uh, got a question from Trey. It says, you mentioned GFSI audits being accepted by FDA as verification. How do you yeah. confirm that the GFSI audit is relevant to hazards identified in your own hazard analysis? That's a really good question. Um, and, and if you think about a GFSI audit, it usually isn't specific to hazards. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's looking at systems. It's looking at um, is is there a risk based approach in place in in the facility? Um, so far, I have not seen FDA push back on using a GFSI audit for as a, for part of the on site audit for supply chain risk control part of FISMA. <clears throat> if that happens, um, then as a community, we all need to share that so we we know how to deal with it. We know we know what to change and how to change it. Um, I do believe that that if, if you've identified in the spice example, the steam pasteurizer is, is a really important part of, the, um, um, of, of controlling a risk you've identified in the spice, just to stick with that example, and the, and the GFSI audit doesn't mention that at all, and you've got mm -hmm. questions about is it validated, show me the data, ask for that specifically. Don't, yeah. you know, use, use your smarts. And if you say, my biggest risk from that supplier is the black pepper I'm sourcing, the GFSI audit has said nothing about their pasteurization process, fine, you've got the audit, you've checked that box, but it, do you feel comfortable they've controlled your risk? No. So go back mm -hmm. to that supplier and say, send me the validation of that steam pasteurizer, send me your SOP of how you are monitoring that it's working on every batch and every lot that you send me, ask for it. And if mm -hmm. they won't send it or they can't send it, then rethink your supplier. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Uh, we, have, we haven't stumped you yet, David, so I got one last one. I didn't think we'd stump you, but uh, we got one last one to sneak in here, if you don't mind. Uh, of course. What is, what is the regulatory requirement for restaurants now uh, and restaurant corporations that are having items manufactured uh, or purchasing agreements, uh, ingredients for stores? Um, okay, another great question. Remember, restaurants, retailers are not subject to uh, the preventive control requirements. So we talked about um, food safety plans. We talked about supply chain control. If you are a registered firm, um, and registration applies to manufacturers, processors, packers, and holders, does not apply to restaurants and retail. So. If you are if you are a, a restaurant, um, then you are not required to register, so you don't you're not required to have a food safety plan. However, you may be an importer under the under the foreign supplier verification program. Um, a lot of restaurants, um, big ones, big chains, are indeed importers in their own right, so they are subject to the foreign supplier verification program. So if you're a restaurant. And you're, and you're sort of saying, oh, does, does, does these, do these regulations apply to me? The preventive control rules, food safety plans do not. But if you're an importer and, the, the, and, and bringing food products directly into the United States, you're causing that food to be imported because you're using it in your restaurants, then you could very well be compliant, need to be compliant with the importer requirements under the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. Like I talked about, Brian, it's the same principles of risk-based um, regulatory compliance. Um, mm -hmm. 
And, and if you are, if you're on this call and you're a restaurant and you're wondering, do I fit into that bucket or you don't, that's what we're here for. So take it offline. Yeah. You know how to reach us. Um, it's still up there. Um, yeah. Call tag. We'll, we'd be happy to chat with you um, informally and sort of say, no, you're fine, or yeah, you do need to be compliant. Yeah. If you're not sure, but that's the principle of it. Um, preventive control rules, no. Foreign supplier verification program, if you're an importer, possibly yes. Yeah. And, and I want to uh, add to that, our customers rave about that, and they really are a great resource, and they really do love uh, talking with people. So that not only a couple of you have asked for some really specific items, their website there, the atchisongroup.com, has got a ton of great stuff. So I can't say enough about um, the glowing re responses we get from clients that uh, we either partner with or refer over to them, and highly recommend you guys check out their site and uh, really stay connected to, uh, to TAG there. So uh, with that, I think we've got through the Q&A. We want to make sure everyone gets out and gets back to uh, all of this hard work we're doing. Uh, we've got a few other resources we can make available, uh, including this recording and the, uh, uh, the actual deck itself, which uh, Dr. Atchison has been so kind enough to, to let us uh, distribute. Um, we've also got some opportunities to share a little bit more about this tool that we're working on with them that we are so excited about, and we're going to have a demo day coming up real soon about that, so uh, definitely keep your eyes open for that. Uh, we also have some other recorded webinars and downloads. So again, the idea is to make sure we're sharing this content, helping improve as a community, and uh, Dr. Etcherson, you, you certainly did that today. We're so grateful for all the information and for you uh, really helping us out today. Uh, really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. No, appreciate being uh -huh. part of it, and thank you for the good questions. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you uh, took something away, and uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully, we'll see you next month. Take care.